Oh, yeah, it's a special individual. This guy has got the guts of a burglar. He's mentally tough. And I knew that he had the confidence to go out there and do the job that he did tonight. He's got a, a hell of a future in front of him. Uh, I told him in the club, you're going to pitch a great game today. I know everybody would like to have guys that hit balls out of the ballpark and and do all these things. But you can appreciate what it takes to win games when you watch what Josh Beckert did. I can't believe we're on the game tomorrow. That's that's kind of the weird thing right now. I'm not, not to say that winning the world championship is not a big thing but like we just uh we don't have a game tomorrow it's, we, we play this whole season and everything like that so it's kind of a relief and we get to go deer hunting now he never doubted himself on three days rest mckee never doubted them the team never doubted them and were it not for john Shaw willis the new get urbina getting up in the eighth they wouldn't need anybody else Brett saberhagen folks the youngest world series mvp at 21 years when he was so great for the royals in that 85 world series and, of course, Josh Beckett now hops on this list. Tori alluded to it. You love to have guys hitting the ball out of the park. The Marlins win with great pitching. They hit only two home runs in this World Series. And you were a supporter of the decision to have Beckett go. You figured if anybody could do it, he could. Well, I thought, you know, he is definitely above in the, in the gene pool and the other guys, but he throws so much. He pitch, he throws long toss after each game. He throws his bullpen before he starts. I mean, he's different. But, Carl, 10 days ago, he struck out. Uh, three days ago, he struck out 10 Yankees. And so they were going to jump on that fastball. They'd seen this curveball before, and they didn't want to get in counts where he could throw that curveball. He threw enough changeups to kind of keep them off balance, and then the curveball was his big out pitch tonight. Pudge Rodriguez called a terrific game. He never shook him off one time. He went with what his catcher was calling. And you know, a lot of people say, don't draft high school pitchers. They all break down. This guy is special. Kerry Wood is special. Dontrell Willis, and there are many more. I love what the Marlins have done they, they went with the number one guy they picked and they carried him all the way through to the series and they jumped on his back and they used him to a championship congratulations to the marlins and josh Beck. and not only that i mean they picked him they wrote him and he came through there's not a lot of 18 year olds not a lot of 20 something on the yankees all their pitchers in their 30s and some in their 40s they knew this is the end of a dynasty here or at least a generation of yankees the front office and uh, people in charge design uh, this team to not to play good in the postseason, but but to win. And uh, when that doesn't happen, obviously a lot of people are uh, are going to be very upset. You know, including the players. You know, I don't think there's anybody more upset than than we are. It was a very disappointing ending. Um, Andy pitched great. Uh, Josh Beckett was unbelievably great. Uh, and it, um, you know, they certainly deserve to be world champs. It makes it a disappointing season, to be honest with you. Uh, you know, especially everything this ball club went through with all the injuries and, and everything. Uh, you know, it had been nice to walk away with that. It's been a long, tough year. We fought through a lot. Um, but we did fall short of, of our ultimate goal. And, and you know, it's, it's up to the powers that be here uh, to figure out a way to get us back here in a position to try to try to win four uh, games in a World Series, not just two. And that's why you play, is to win. That's the bottom line. I mean, uh, that's why you compete. And uh, we didn't get it done, so that's, that's basically it. And for a franchise so used to winning, you can see how difficult it is to, to even accept the concept of losing. But they'll be back. Oh, they'll be back because they always have great players. And this is one of the years that they had great players who didn't play well. And this was a situation that they had great starting pitching, and after that, they had very little to look forward to. One guy in the bullpen, very porous defense, and an offense that left so much to be desired that two of their best hitters were on the bench in game five. So they'll look forward to building this, getting it back together. I'm sure they will, but this really wasn't a team that should have been the world champions. Two different philosophies, too. For the Yankees, it seems like such a business. And Jack McKeon said about his philosophy with the Marlins, quote, let's have fun. Let's fool the baseball world. They did have fun <laughs> the entire season. Remember that giant Marlins series ended at a play at the plate? The key play in this series, a play at the plate. We'll have more on that later. Now Neil Everett with what's coming up. Still inside this action-packed sports center, a wild day in the SEC, a clash of the Tigers down by the bayou, and Tennessee ran into a tidal wave in Tuscaloosa. Casey Clawson and crew wondering why they volunteered for this overtime tug-of-war. Sooner or later, everyone stumbles. Would the nation's number one get buffaloed in Boulder while the Trojans try to make a big BCS claim against the familiar Pac-10 foe? 
And could a historic day at the Breeders' Cup end pleasantly perfect? Oh, we've got races. Too close to call. They are celebrating the World Series Championship in Florida. This is the area known as Little Havana. Jack McKeon and the Marlins are now the big men in Little Havana. What a catch McKeon was. Ditto for catcher Pudge Rodriguez. He's with our Dan Schulman. Well, Pudge doing some celebrating here with Mike Lowell. Did you, you were 10 games under 500 in May. You had injuries, a new manager. Did you always believe this team could do this? Well, you know, I know that we start the season uh, uh, struggle a little bit, but uh, but we work hard in spring training to put this thing together. And uh, and believe me, we believe in ourselves. We never give up all year. And uh, and after the All-Star we started to play uh, a good baseball, winning the World Cup, and, uh, and look at what we are, winning the World Series. How, how did Josh Beckett take his game to this unbelievably high level in October? He's a, he's, he's a tremendous pitcher. I mean, he's got a, a hell of a future in front of him. What I want him to do is just to relax, you know, use all his pitches and get the ball down, and that's what he did all night. A last thought. It wasn't just Beckett. Carl Pavano, Brad Penny, a team effort, right? Yeah, absolutely. Everybody do their part, you know, and, uh, I mean, you have a hell of a season. Go celebrate. Thank you. Thank you. Pudge Rodriguez going to celebrate with his teammates. Well, if the Marlins finish above 500 next season, it's all over. They're going to win the World Series. Florida has had just two winning seasons in its 11-year history. And both times, they went on to win the Fall Classic. Let's get to the football high drama in Tuscaloosa, where Casey Clawson and the Tennessee Volunteers are trying to avoid losing three straight for the first time since 92. 40 seconds left in the game. Falls down seven. Mark Jones all the way down for a first down to the one. Very next play. Vols trying to get the tying touchdown. It's Clawson, Troy Fleming. We are even at 20. They would go to overtime, and this would be a recurring theme. <laughs> We're already into the second OT here. Alabama, Tim Castile, 12 yards. 34-27 tied. So now it's Tennessee's turn to answer. Facing a fourth and 19. Here's your ball game. Clawson, C.J. Faton. First down. Clawson, 23 of 43. 283 and four scores. So first and goal. It's Casey into the end zone. Deflected to James Banks. Are you kidding? Take a look again. Freddie Roach is in there, and he gets a hand on And I'm making this a top-10 nominee, and you know what? I'm not even asking anybody. You can do that? Yeah, apparently. Tennessee stays alive. It's 34-all. Let's go to the third overtime now. Casey for Banks. Got it. Now, after two OTs, you must go for two, and the Vols miss the conversion. So now it's Bama's turn. They go to Sean Williams, 12 yards. He carried 40 times for 166. Alabama has to go for two. They can win it. Brody Coyle intercepted by Jabari Greer. So it's 40 to 40. Let's go to a fifth overtime. Clawson sneaks it. They do convert to two, so Tennessee up 51-43. Bama has got to have a touchdown, and they are facing a fourth and two right here. Here's Croyle. Dre Fulgham. Jason Allen breaks it up. Tennessee wins in five overtimes. Falls, first visitor ever to win three straight at Bryant Denny. The fact that Tennessee had to put a lot of overtime Saturday should come as no surprise to fans of the Volunteers. They won a 6 OT marathon against Arkansas last season, but went just 4-4 four and four after that. The Vols at 5-2, and two, host Duke next weekend, and then they go to Miami. Huge SEC West game in Baton Rouge. Ninth-ranked LSU hosting number 21 Auburn first quarter. Let's take a look at Matt Mock. 64 yards, Devery Henderson. And it is 7-0 LSU. Still first quarter, Carnell Cadillac Williams. 496 yards and eight touchdowns in his previous three games. And he is stuffed here by Chad Lavallee. No relation to Art Vandelay. A heck of an architect. Yeah, he's, he always didn't want to be an architect. Fourth down, Cadillac, 20 carries, only 61 yards. Next LSU drive, Mock, Michael Clayton, 14 nothing LSU. Mock, 17 of 28, 224 and three touchdowns. Take another look, Henderson, and watch the block here. Oh, that's nice. And Michael Clayton has nothing but open space in front of him. 24-0 LSU, Jason Campbell sacked. Auburn sacked four times. Next LSU drive, Mock Henderson. 
Tommy Tuberville said they lined up and whipped us on both sides. LSU wins 31-7. And LSU and Auburn tied for second in the SEC West behind Ole Miss. Alabama-Birmingham was a four-touchdown dog at fifth-ranked Georgia, but it was the Bulldogs who about got dogs. Third quarter game tied at 10, David Green. One of two picks, Justin Whitmore here leads to a Blazer field goal. Georgia trailing in its own homecoming to UAB. Early fourth, Billy Bennett with his third field goal boot. Bulldogs up 16-13. UAB gets inside the Georgia 40, but this is a redshirt freshman mistake here. Quarterback Chris Williams sacked by Derek White. Georgia 16-13, Florida next weekend. Number one, Oklahoma winless in Boulder since 1988. Look out for Ralph, the Sooners opening drive. Jason White, Brandon Jones, 54-yard touchdown. OU has scored on its opening drive in every game this season. It's 7-0 Sooners. First play of their next drive. Ronaldo works, working it. Breaks a bunch of tackles. Add another 15 yards at the end of this for a face mask. Works carry 20 times for 130 yards. Led to another Oklahoma touchdown. Fourth quarter, Joel Klatt, Derek McCoy. Platt through for three scores. Colorado back within seven. Just over two minutes left. Third and seven for OU. White, Mark Clayton, and he slips a tackle and keeps on matriculating the ball up the field. White, 19 of 28, 248, three scores. Sooners, 8-0. Pac-10, number four, USC at Washington. Trojans favored by 10, haven't won at Seattle in 10 years. USC trying to become a BCS favorite. Up a six-pack in the third, Matt Leinart. Had a favorite receiver Sunday, Saturday, and it wasn't Mike Williams, but true freshman Reggie Bush, 60 yards. Liner, 351 yards, four touchdowns, but said afterwards he thought the player of the game was Bush. Tally, 213 yards running and receiving, and the Huskies get dog, 43-23. USC hosts Washington State next weekend. Sixth-ranked Cougs hosting Oregon State this weekend. Beaver Nation up a point in the second quarter. Derek Anderson finds Mike Haas. 66 yards for the score. Top 10 nominee, if it's okay with you. Yeah, go ahead. Thanks okay. for asking. We're doing it. Anderson just 16 of 42, though. Fourth quarter, Cougar Nation up a point. Matt Kegel picked five times, three times by Mitch Musin, but OSU leads the nation in penalties. Pick denied. Very next play, Jonathan Smith for the score. His second. Oh, they're partying at the Coug. 36-30. Wazoo. Ten years after becoming the first woman to win a Triple Crown race, Julie Crone became the first female jockey to win a Breeders' Cup race. Saturday, the Hall of Famer guided Half Bridled to victory in the juvenile fillies. Half Bridled trained by Richard Mandela, who ten years ago enjoyed the best day of his career at the 93 Breeders' Cup. Saturday, Mandela had what's being called the greatest day in racing history. It ended with the final race of the eight on the card. The breed We're in New York, but it's the Marlins who have raised their hands and their arms because they're sure they are the 2003 World Series champions, winning at Yankee Stadium, getting a shutout from Josh Beckett. This is remarkable, folks. Jack McKean, of course, came in here, the midseason replacement. Torbord was let go. He joins Bob Lemon in 1978 as the only midseason replacement manager to win the World Series. And you know, when you think about Jack McCann, you got to think about the man's background, too. He's been a GM, he's traded guys, been a farm director. He knows how to work with young players. He's done a great job. Experience certainly helped Jack McKeon. The experience of Jeff Conine certainly helped this team. He's with Dan Shulman. Jeff, uh, at the end of August, you're minding your own business with Baltimore. Turned out pretty well for you, huh? It's a dream come true. You can't. It can't turn out any better than what it did. I mean, get to be able to go back home, play with a bunch of guys like this, win a world championship. That uh, doesn't get any better. After the NLCS, you said shock the world. We're shocking the world. But do you guys really believe this is any kind of an upset? Not in our clubhouse. We know what kind of team we had. Josh Beckett had a great quote yesterday just saying that, you know, there's curses and billy goats and all this stuff going on, but nobody gave us credit for having an awesome team, and we showed it in the postseason. What about the young guys like Beckett and Willis and Cabrera and what they did for you? Josh Beckett, I mean, 23 years old, performance he gave tonight was legendary. Coming in a house like this against a team like that and do what he did was unbelievable. Congratulations. Thank you. Jeff Conine of the world champion Florida Marlins. Back to you guys. Dan, thank you very much. Ironic, too, in the 100th anniversary of the World Series, the Yankees play their 100th game here 
and they lose and we're talking about all this experience and all this youth but when it comes down to fundamentals the middle infield for the Florida Marlins have been so consistent all season long as good as it gets in baseball and they were huge in this series. Carl they're the best combination in all of baseball and, and not only fielding but also offensively these two have been spectacular all year and a lot of people were hard on Alex Gonzalez and begin the series but defense has been the key. Look at this turn how quick they work together every day. Perry Hill's been a great job working with them. And this is a game saver right there. Not a whole lot of second bases even get to that ball. But the way they play defense, set up the offense. Castillo never quit. He said today, I'm going to come up big. And he did. This is the big hit right here. And then Gonzalez. Everybody all over Alex Gonzalez's offense in the postseason. Well, he had a big hit in Chicago that vaulted him past the Cubs. And then this no bigger home run in his playoff season this year was that home run to win the ball game in Florida. These two guys played consistent D, and their offense came when you, it's an added bonus when they perform on the offensive side because their defense is so good. This is how teams used to be built, and we've got, we fall in love with guys hitting 30, 40 home runs a season, but you forget about the defense. When you catch the ball, you give your team a chance to win. That's what these two guys and do. And you fall in love with 20-game winners. They may have a few in the years to come with Burnett coming back and certainly what we've seen from Josh Beckett and Brad Penny, but this is a team that has not won very beautifully and that play at the plate was sort of typical of what the Florida Marlins have done all season Bobby yeah, they got a base at the right field with two outs and Ozzie Guillen who's had, had a great job of uh, coach at third base today sends Gonzalez the throws up the line the only place that Gonzalez could go is back door so he slides by the plate and only gives a hand or an arm to Posada to tag. That was the only place in his body he could make the tag. He missed the tag, and he got his hand in on the plate. Fabulous job by everyone around. It was a good throw, just up the line a little. A great catch and tried to tag. If Posada comes right back to the plate, rather than going to the runner, he might have a chance of cutting him off. But Gonzalez makes the slide that wins the ball game, and that's what it's all about. Well, and you can't say enough about the call Tim Wilkie made yeah. right there in that situation to be in the right position Yankee to Stadium. make that call. <laughs> in Yankee Stadium. You yeah. never heard anything great about job, the umpires Tim. in this one. A great job. And as you saw that home run from Gonzalez, he was one for 13 in that game four when he hit that home run. They can look to the stars. They can look to the sky and look at each other. They're World Series champs. Back to you. When Bowling Green played at Northern Illinois last season, Huskies fans threw beer cans at the Falcons' bus, painted their faces, painted their bodies, banged thunder sticks. In the first inning of that game, scored three runs with two outs. That theme continued in game six. Two out runs, two out hits, two strike hits. And those two strike hits and two out hits come from inside, not only outside. You have to want to do it. You can't give in. You can't say, oh, darn, it's two strikes or there's two outs. You have to just keep battling, and that's what they did. Cabrera, he's 20 years old. Roger Clements had him two strikes, tried to intimidate him, going up and up and in. It didn't matter. He took him deep for a two-run homer. Brad Penny came up with two outs. He said, I could get a hit. He believed he could get a hit. He got a hit and drove in two runs. And tonight, one of the most unlikely RBI men on the entire team, Luis Castillo, had two strikes, fouled off five other pitches, and then got a breaking ball on the outside and drove in Gonzalez for the first indecisive run of game six of the World Series. When you believe and you feel it, you can do it. But if you don't believe, you have no chance, especially with two outs or two strikes in an at-bat. This was a tough team to get on the ropes, and once they were on the ropes, they're real tough to knock out. Now, the Yankees let them in at the sixth inning. People are going to look at Jeter starts it off with an error, and then they get a man on, and then there's the bunt play to Andy Pettit. And some are going to say, why not get the lead runner? Little League, get the lead runner. They didn't do well, it here. Well, it was interesting, Carl, because you're basically trained to go ahead and get two. And if you get two, he's going to get out of this, uh, this, this inning. And that's what Andy Pettit's thinking immediately. Ball's bunted back. Catcher's yelling second. Everybody's thinking second base. And they try to turn it over. It doesn't happen. And you know, you're probably wondering at home, go to third base. Well, that you do that in Little League, but you're going to get one out of third. And this is a big league play. If Derek's able to turn this over, that's two outs. They're going to get out of the inning. They didn't turn a double play. It ended up being a big play because they got the sack fly the next out. And that is how the play is made. You don't all of a sudden decide that you're going to go to third base. You've already got it in your mind before the ball is bunted where you want to go. And that's right back at him. He's thinking, ball back at me. I'm going to second, try to get two. Quick runner and Derek Lee going down. Meantime, fans in Chicago, baseball fans in Boston, those guys tended to tune out when their teams checked out. They all have to be wondering how. How does this Florida Marlins team that plays its home games in a football stadium 
plays in front of empty seats with another World Series, their second in seven seasons. Tim Kirchin's got the answer to that. An improbable regular season by the Marlins was followed by two improbable playoff rounds, which were topped by an improbable World Series. The Marlins overcame all doubts to become the second team in history to win a world championship in a season in which they were once 10 games under 500. That's why they would play the games. We're not, we're not going to lay down and die just because you know, some other person thinks we can't win. All during the playoffs, we couldn't do this. We didn't have the pitch. We didn't have no power. But every day we played with heart. And can't nobody scout heart. Can't nobody talk about heart. But we went out there and proved it. I think we're the true mark of a team because we didn't have one or two guys just carry us. It seemed like it was a different guy each series, each situation. The history of the Marlins has been improbable. They have two 500 seasons, no division titles, and fewer wins in their 11-year existence than, among others, the Padres and Rockies, yet they have two world championships. Over the last 28 years, the Dodgers are the only other National League team with that many. Nobody gave us a chance, and here they are, the world's champs. Tremendous story. You know, my hat's off to the players and the coaches and the organization. We ran into a team that played better than us. And that's the bottom line. I mean, there's no other way to put it. They deserve to win. They beat San Francisco, beat Chicago, and they beat us. So uh, they deserve to be champs. With all the curses and billy goats and, and uh, jinxes and ghosts, nobody gave us credit for being just a, a great team. And we, sh we proved it tonight. In the 100th World Series game played at Yankee Stadium, the Marlins became the first team to win an elimination game here since the 1981 Dodgers, spanning a record 18 postseason series. The Marlins, improbable from day one to championship two. In New York, Tim Kirkjian, ESPN. Tim, thank you. Now 64 and 36 in those 100 games. And sweetness for Jeffrey Loria as he touches home in the other team's ballpark.